knows Dana. If you want to be involved in the jam session or you have questions about the jam session, just see Dana. But it's really an opportunity for anybody, anybody, not just the people that you see up the front every other week playing music and singing. If you um, have a bit of a musical bone in your body but you might feel a little bit shy or reserved, um, this is the opportunity to come on that Friday night and just jump, jump up and bring your instrument, um, grab a mic, have a sing-along and um, just enjoy some, a jam, a jam session together. So that's what that's all about. Um, tomorrow night there's a, a board meeting for those board members, 7 p.m. So if you can just remember that, we have a board meeting tomorrow night and that's about it for our announcements today. So welcome to church. Um, I want to invite up a few guys that um, two weeks ago had a fun time and they did something special and we're going to hear all about it. So you would have heard about, come up guys and grab a mic. Is it just Jess? Any other? Where's the team? Keith? Who else? Greg's at the top on sound. But thanks to Greg, um, we had a long weekend and there was an opportunity for people to go and do a bike ride. Unfortunately, that weekend, I was up in Auckland trying to play basketball with all the young people. And um, I think I lasted about two minutes on the court before I got subbed off because I'm too unfit. <laughs> That's what happens when you haven't played for like two years. Anyway, if I wasn't there, I would be here with these guys riding a bike. So Jess, tell us, where did you go? Well, the picture that you can see up there is uh, where we started from, and that's just on the shores of Lake Karapiro. And um, yeah, I'm sure Greg would want me to mention his great invention, which is the trailer that can hold 12 electric bikes. So uh, he, he did very well, and, and, it, and it worked well, the, oh, the okay. I, I must have missed that part about electric bikes. Were there any like manual old school bikes there or were they yes, um, the, electric? The, the, there was only one intrepid biker by the name two. of... Uh, two. Oh, okay. Thanks. Well, uh, the one I knew about was Nigel. And, uh, yeah. uh, but I mean, he's rode bikes around Europe, so... Um, okay. The best. Yeah. And Kester? Oh, right, and Kester. And if I was there, I would have been on my manual old school bike too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but it was, it was a great ride. As you can see, it follows um, uh, the Waikato River. And um, that's just a picture of some of it there. There we go. Just notice in the background just that concrete path. That was one of the things that really amazed me about this bike ride, how well appointed this trail was. Um, the council must have spent lots of money. So it was really a good, easy ride. So if you have an electric bike, you know, next time the church puts on a, a bike tour, grab it. And that is the picture of where we had lunch at a, at a nice cafe called The Punnet because it was built on an old strawberry farm, thus the name. But uh, that was the great thing about um, the ride, I'm sure you would uh, agree, Keith, was just the connection with people, just riding along, enjoying the scenery and chatting to people. Yes, uh, it was a lovely ride, a 30-kilometre uh, um, one way, so 60-kilometre total, but a very easy ride and um, one of the, the nicest rides I think I've been on. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Okay, I, I got a little bit scared when you said 30 k's then one way. So 60 k's all up? 60 k's total. Okay, and how long did that take? Oh, jeez. About... Uh, we, we had a, an hour for lunch. Yeah, and, probably five and, hours in total. Yeah. Five hours in total. Oh, it looks like I've missed out, and a few of us have missed out on an on a enjoyable experience. So that's a little uh, a taste of what you can potentially do. Uh, I'm sure Greg will organise another ride in the near future. Um, I know that um, Pastor Andrew and, and Nora are always down for a bike ride. Um, and is it still called, I heard like there was a name a few years ago, the Holy Riders? No? Is that still going? Do. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we encourage you church family, if you enjoy riding, there will be more opportunities in the future, but that's what we all missed out on. And um, yeah. We um, are glad to hear that you survived, and, and there's a little video clip just to finish off. 
so let's switch get back, back. This. Here comes Nigel. Thanks, guys. Jess, Keith, Kester, Dean, Karen, Alan, Bronnie. Lucky you got power, eh? Cool. Okay, so thank you for, um, to Greg and the team for organising that ride. And um, yeah, put my name down for the next one. Hopefully I won't be playing basketball. Um, now it's time for our offering. So I'd like to invite our deacons to collect our offering. And today it's for local church. Thank you.
really love if all the children could please come up and join us for the song. All the children please. Children, you can stay up for the children's story now. Would all the children just like to move up this side? There's a lot more space and we won't be so squashed. So we just come over here. And then you'll be able to see and you'll be able to hear. Have we got space for everybody? You're a little bit far away. Would you like to come and sit a bit closer? You're going to be able to see from there? Wonderful. You sit down there on the carpet if you need to. Aren't you going to sit right there beside me? That's wonderful. Right. Who can tell me what this word means? Well, who can tell me what the word is? Can anyone read that word? It's a long word. Persevere. Now, who's got an idea what it means? Anyone know what it means? Well. There's a verse in the Bible that tells us what it means. In 2 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, Don't get tired of doing what is right. Would you like to hold that? In other words, keep going. Would you like to hold that one? Don't give up. Is that what persevere means? You can hold that one. Don't stop. Would you like to hold that one? So if you're persevering, you won't stop. Keep making an effort. That's another meaning. Be determined. Is there anyone here who's determined? Always wants to get it done? Pass it down to the girls down there. This is an unusual word. Endure. Do you know what that one means? Have you heard of endurance races? That means it's tough and you just got to hang in there. Would one of you girls like to hold that one? And there's a little bit that's really important when you persevere. What does that say? What does this one say? Even if it's hard. So you've got to keep going. You don't stop. You keep on doing it even if it's hard. Right, who wants to hold that one? Who hasn't got one? There you are, there. Now, when I'm talking to you, if I'm talking about what your sign says, you can wave it or point to it, all right? And I want to start with telling you about a story you might have already heard. It's a story about two frogs. And these frogs, can you see my frogs? Yeah. They went on an adventure. And they're having a wonderful time in the kitchen. You can hold it. 
They were having a wonderful time, jumping over the plates, climbing up the forks and jumping off the ends until they fell in the bowl of cream. Now, the bowl of cream was deep and they couldn't get out. And one frog, he just said, this is too hard. I can't get out of here. And so he just sunk to the bottom of the bowl and stayed there. So you just keep your frog down the bottom there. But the other frog, where's our other little frog? He said, oh, this is, you've got to make him hop around. Because he says, I'm not giving up. I'm going to just keep trying and find a way out of here. There has to be a way I can get out of here. So he hopped around, got him hopping around in the cream. He jumped up and down in the cream. He swam round and round in the cream. And what happens to cream when you shake it and stir it? What happens to cream? Have you ever shaken cream or beaten it up? Turns to butter. And so eventually, the little frog found himself sitting on a pile of butter and he could hop out. Now, did he give up? Did it get hard? Yes, it got really hard, but he kept going and he got out of the bowl. Now, there's lots of important people who persevered. How many of you have heard of Walt Disney? You heard of Walt Disney? Disneyland, right. How many of you are familiar with Minnie Mouse? Yeah. Do you know Walt Disney was told it was a dumb idea? It would be an absolute failure. Don't even try to make it into anything. Did he listen? Did he give up? Did he keep trying? And do you know, Minnie Mouse is about 94 and she's still popular. So just as well he didn't give up. How many of you have seen or heard of Mary Poppins? Seen the film Mary Poppins with her umbrella? It's a very famous film. Do you know that Walt Disney tried for 16 years, that's older than any of you, to get the lady who wrote the story of Mary Poppins to give him permission to make the film? Do you think that was hard work? Do you think he was determined? Yeah. And what about KFC? Did you know, did you know Colonel Sanders had this recipe for chicken? And he tr asked 1,009 restaurants and cafes and chefs to make his recipe. And they all said it won't sell. It won't taste any good at all. But on the 1,010th time, they said, yeah, this is a goer. And KFC was born. Now, what if Colonel Sanders had given up after 1,009 times, be no KFC. All right, but the real story I want to tell you is about a little boy who was six. Now, who's six? Is there anyone here who's six? You're six. All right, so this little boy was born in 1909. All right, so you come, how old are you? You're three. Well, he was twice as old as you. All right, so he was six. And in 1909, children had to work really hard, even if they were only very little. And Glenn's job was to walk three kilometres to school. Now, that's about ha halfway from here to the roundabout, because we measured it this morning. It's a long way for a six-year-old to walk early in the morning. And he had to get to school before anyone else and light the fire. Have you ever helped bring the wood in to light the fire? Well, that was his job, and he had to get the schoolroom warm for everyone else. And one morning, he was lighting the fire, and there was this big whoosh, and then a bang, and the fire exploded. And Glenn was very badly burnt, and they didn't think he was going to live. But after a lot of time, he gradually regained consciousness, and he heard his mum and the doctor whispering in the corner of the room. And the doctor was saying, he's never going to walk. His legs are so badly burnt that he won't ever be able to walk. He'll be in a wheelchair. Had no toes at all left on one foot. 
and the other foot was so burnt and so scarred that it was five, two, no, five centimetres, two inches, that much shorter than the other leg. And Glenn heard them, and even though he was only six, he said, that's not right, I'm going to walk, and kept that in his mind. He said, I'm determined. Who's got determined? I'm determined I'm going to walk. So when he was eventually allowed home, his parents had to massage his leg. And you know, his legs were very sore, but they would massage them and rub them and try and stretch them. Do you know why they had to do that? Because what happens to muscles if you don't use them? They just shrivel up. And he couldn't walk to use them, so his parents used to rub them and massage them. <gasps> it was so painful. And his dad's arms would get tired and he'd stop. And then his mum would massage and rub his legs. And her arms got so tired that she had to stop. So then Glenn would bend over and he would try and rub his legs himself. Because what was he determined to do? He was going to walk. He wasn't going to give up. So every day when it was fine, his mum popped him out in his wheelchair in the sunshine. And he said, if I'm going to walk, I can't stay in the wheelchair. So he threw himself out of the wheelchair. And then he used his arms to haul himself over to a picket fence. Now, do you know what a picket fence is? What's a picket fence look like? You don't see them very often these days. It's a fence with fence posts about that wide. And about that high off, and they have a little fancy shape on the top, and they've got a space about that big between them, and often they're painted white. And he hauled himself over to the fence. Can you haul yourself on your arms? You can have that one. I'm sure she'll let you. Here, you hold this one. It's a nice bright orange one. And he grabbed onto the paling, and he pulled himself up because his legs didn't work, and he got to sort of stand up, so then he reached for the next paling and he dragged himself across a bit and then he reached for the next one. Oh, he was so tired. Did he give up? Did he keep going? Did he stop because it was hard? He went round the whole section and every day he dragged his legs that didn't work around the section until finally he'd made a path right around the section beside the fence. And one day, when he's pulling himself up onto the paling, he felt a bit stronger in his legs and he let go. And do you know what happened? He could stand there by himself. Thank you. And after he'd practised standing there, he tried to take a step. And he found he could take a very wobbly step because, remember... The doctors reckoned he wouldn't work, but did he, was he determined? Did he keep going even if it was hard? And so he practised standing and take a step. <gasps> it was so painful when he tried to move his legs. And after he could take a wobbly, painful step, he discovered that if he sort of did a hop and a fast step, it didn't hurt. And so he did a few more hops and fast steps. And Glenn discovered he could run. Now, it was a very ungraceful run because he was doing this hot, wobbly step with his short leg. But he started running and he ran everywhere. He ran to school, he ran around the farm, he ran around the house. And by the time he was 12, not only was he running in races at school, he was winning them. And by the time he got to high school, he was setting new records. He was running the 1,500 metres faster than anyone else. And when he got to university, he kept running with his funny, awkward, hobbly, hopping run. And he ran faster than anyone else at university. Was it hard work? Oh, I had to practice a lot and train a lot. But he set records at university. And do you know, for 10 years, he was the fastest middle distant runner in the whole of America. How did a little boy who couldn't use his legs, get to be the fastest runner in America. Because he kept persevering. And then he went to the Olympic Games. And he was just beaten at the finishing line for a gold medal. And do you know who beat him? 
Jack Lovelock. Do you know who Jack Lovelock is? He's a New Zealander. So Glenn Cunningham missed his gold medal because a New Zealander could run the 1500s one-tenth of a second faster. Now, because of all those things you've got, keep making an effort, don't give up. He was able to achieve amazing things with his running. But do you know, when he wasn't running, he had to work. And he had a farm, called it a ranch. And on that farm, he used to invite teenagers who weren't making very good choices. Teenagers who were getting into trouble. Teenagers who were doing the wrong thing. And he'd say, come and live on our ranch. And you know, he would have up to 84 teenagers living on his farm. It's just as well they had a 12-bedroom house, wasn't it? And didn't have much help from anyone else, just his wife and he with all these teenagers, loving them and helping them. Do you think that was hard work? Do you think you'd find it hard work doing the dishes for 84 people? Or cleaning the floor for 84 people? So you will understand that his greatest verse in the Bible was Isaiah 40 verse 31. And it says, if you rely on God, you'll be as strong as an eagle and you'll run and not get weary. And that was why Glenn Cunningham and his wife could help 9,000 teenagers. So when you have to do something that's hard, and it's tough, and you feel like giving up, I want you to remember Glenn Cunningham. And remember the Bible says, don't get tired doing what is right, because God will help you to persevere, and you can achieve great things too. So thank you. Isn't it amazing, all those wonderful stories about perseverance? I think it's amazing that um, when we lose our own strength, we can rely on God. And in the song, it talks about um, God being our strength when we're weak, which I think is amazing, that we can rely on God when we're not feeling like we can do it. Can we please so uh, stand as we sing, um, You're My All in All.
please remain standing for our next song, Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just um, thank you that we can come and worship you this morning. Lord, thank you for um, the week that has been, um, for those that have had a, a trying week. Lord, we thank you that um, we have 
uh, a blessed Sabbath rest, Lord, and for those that have had a, a good week, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for um, the hills and the valleys of life that we all um, go through um, each and every week, and we thank you for um, your strength that you give to us and the um, endurance that we need um, to face each new week, Lord. And so as we come here this Sabbath, Lord, we just um, ask that your Holy Spirit will just um, renew us, Lord, um, that we may be refreshed and that we may receive um, a blessing from on high this morning as we um, prepare our hearts to receive a message on um, perseverance and endurance this morning. Lord, thank you for the beautiful children's story um, and the testimony um, of these people that have um, persevered and weathered the storms and done amazing things and helped so many people. Um, Lord, we know that um, that is your plan and desire for each and every one of us. And so we just pray, um, Lord, that you will come soon, but um, in that time in between that you'll give us endurance um, as we face every new day. Um, Lord, I just pray for those of our church family who are not here physically this morning due to ill health, Lord, and just pray that um, your loving arms will be around them this morning, that they may recover um, from sickness and um, whatever they may be experiencing um, today, Lord. May they know that um, you love them and that you care for them and that you are the master ph physician. Um, Lord, we just thank you that um, this morning we can bring into your storehouse our tithes and offerings, Lord, and just ask that you'll um, take these offerings, Lord, and, and use them for um, your work in our community here in Bethlehem and Tauranga, this um, place we call home. Um, may this church continue to be a blessing to those that are around us. Um, as we have a message of hope to share in our city. Um, Lord, I just pray for um, Pastor Hannah as she opens to us the word this morning that you may speak through her, Lord, and uh, we may have receptive hearts this morning to hear um, through your word and through the Holy Spirit. So, um, yeah, thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Oh, it's good to be back here. I was away for two weeks. Um, so the first week I was in the South Island, we had a um, female pastors retreat for um, the female pastors in New Zealand and the Cook Islands. Um, so there was eight pastors there, and we had um, the ministerial secretary from the SPD. She came to facilitate our time there. And out of nine of us there, seven of us got COVID. <laughs> um, so I got it a second time. Um, so I was away, yeah, the first week on retreat, and then the second week I had to isolate. Um, so I just got back on Monday from Christchurch. Um, but yeah, I'm feeling okay. Um, and I was a bit worried because I still <laughs> was struggling from the first time I got it. Um, but it was really interesting because I... The, the day where I got the test, I was quite worried because I thought, oh, I think I have it. Um, and so I was on my way to the pharmacy, and that morning, um, as I came out of the um, accommodation, I saw this huge rainbow um, in the sky, and I took a photo of it. And for me, that was just a reminder. God was just, I think, encouraging me that morning to say that um, it was going to be okay and that yeah, a rainbow always reminds me that God's word never fails. And, you know, when he actually gave the rainbow, it was to promise that he would never send a flood to the world again. And that was, for me, encouraging because all the promises I've read um, that God has given me, I was just claiming those that morning because I just trusted that his word was not going to fail and that he was going to take care of me. Um, and he did, so I'm happy for that. And I'm glad to be back again. Um, and to be here this morning to share um, the word this morning. Um, so before I start, I just want to have a word of prayer, and um, yeah, we'll get into it. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you we can be here to worship you, and I pray that you will lead us through your Holy Spirit to learn what it means to have patient endurance, as it says in Revelation 14, verse 12, 
and by your grace that we can um, be strong and persevere. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So that was kind of my key text this morning on um, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can have a look at that verse. And it's quite a famous verse. It comes after the three angels' um, messages. And it says, Here is the patient, patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this verse, it's talking about the Christian life and how we are to live. Um, so that really comes from the em emphasizing this word patience. Um, and I wanted to dig into that a little bit this morning. Um, but before I start, I wanted to share a story about um, someone who had a lot of patient endurance. And we heard our story this morning for our kids' story. Um, so he had all this perseverance. Um, and there was another story I wanted to share this morning of someone in a similar kind of, um, yeah, similar story but different. Um, and just the circumstances that he went through. Um, so while I was isolating, um, I watched this movie called The Dawn Wall. I don't know if, has anyone seen that movie? Okay, a few people. So it's kind of more like a documentary. Um, and it's about this rock climber, and his name is uh, Tommy Coldwell. And basically, he attempted to climb um, the 3,000-foot dawn wall of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Um, so on the left, that is the picture of the movie. <laughs> um, so they were actually kind of camping on the wall as they're going up. Um, and on the right is actually a picture of Tommy when he was small. Um, and as a young kid, he, kid, he was quite fragile, his dad would say. He was kind of clumsy and socially awkward. And his dad was this tough mountaineering guy. And he looked at his son, and he was very positive about his son. And he just saw in him he had potential to be tough. And he wanted to raise his son to have grit. So what his dad would do is that he would take him out on these expeditions and on some of the hardest climbing walls that were around um, the area. So they were in Colorado. And what his father's philosophy was is that you must prepare your children for the path and not the path for your children. And he did this by um, through elective hardships. So he would kind of put his kid through these kind of tough situations. So he took Tommy out into the mountains. And something I think we're kind of taught is to avoid hardship if we can. But his dad was trying to teach him the opposite. So this um, is a picture on the right. That was the first mountain that they climbed together. It's called Long's Peak in Colorado and it's 4,200 meters high, and he was only seven years old. So he climbed this mountain with his dad. And then on the left, that's him just doing some kind of rock climbing thing. Um, and that's him hanging <laughs> in midair, and he's, I think, six years old there. So his dad really pushed him um, to the limits. And this really, I think, put something in Tommy to um, yeah, to really have this drive and perseverance in him. And he says that the greatest gift that his father gave him was to give him the ability to reframe adversity as adventure. And he taught that if we allow ourselves to, to be exposed to challenge, that the challenge can energize us and show us who we are. And by the time Tommy was a teenager, he was um, one of the best climbers around. And then, um, I think towards he was a teenage or late teens, um, early 20s, they, oh, he was invited to go on this climbing trip to Kyrgyzstan. And they were out climbing this huge mountain, and they heard gunshots kind of ricocheting off the wall, um, off the rock wall, and they were getting shot at by these rebels. 
And so they told them to come down, and yeah, they ended up being taken hostage. So they went for six days, they were wandering um, in the mountains, and they were starving, they didn't have any food, they had no water. And it turned out that there was just one abductor who was kind of leading them through the mountains. And Tommy thought, well, we're either going to die here or this guy dies and we survive. Um, so he actually decided that, well, maybe if I push him off the cliff, that would, um, they would survive. And so that's en what ended up happening. But it turned out this guy didn't die when he was pushed off. But then the rest of the team, there was four of them, they were rescued and they made it back to America. So they went through that experience. And then um, the next kind of bad thing that happened um, was that he was um, using a table saw and he cut off his index finger. So that was shortly after he came back from Kyrgyzstan. And if you know anything about rock climbing, you, know, you use like every part of your finger to hold onto the rocks. And this was just completely um, horrific for a climber, especially. And so Tommy spent two weeks in hospital and he had three surgeries and they couldn't save his finger. And then the doctor sat with him and he was just trying to explain to him, well, maybe you should need to think about um, changing your career because you can't really do what you're, you're doing anymore. But for Tommy, climbing was his life. And he could have thought, well, maybe I am defeated. But what this hardship did it was to create a deeper passion for him to climb and to defy the odds. So he looked at this stub of a finger and then this drive came over him. So he wanted to train, he had to retrain his hands and he would train for 14 hours a day. And as he was training, he was thinking, well, I need a new challenge. And he looked at um, this wall um, in Yosemite. I think there it is. Um, so that's um, El Capitan. And there's one part of it that has never been climbed before. And he decided that he wanted to try and climb it. And the actual height um, of this rock is around 900 meters, and it's pretty much just flat rock. There's not really much to hold onto. So Tommy um, spent about a year analyzing. He would, um, through a top rope, would go down and analyze all the parts of the rock and just try to map out a way to get up to the top. So he was looking for um, any holes um, on the rock and just different features that he could, um, yeah, try to find a way to make, um, make it to the top. And he ended up spending six years doing this um, with his climbing partner. They would just map, up, uh, map out the wall and just trying to figure out each move that they were to make and how to angle their feet, um, where would they place their fingers, um, and just to move their body in a way that they could climb this sheer rock face. So on the seventh year, their perseverance paid off, and they ended up defying all the odds to scale the Dawn Wall in 19 days. And the rest of the world watched in awe. And Tommy finished the climb, and he just had this sense of gratitude and he was thinking, well, this success, it didn't come just from him alone. But he thought of his climbing partner who helped him um, make it up. He thought of his dad who really pushed him to the limit. He thought of his wife and his kid. And he was even grateful for his captor in Kyrgyzstan. And even the table saw that cut his finger off. It was these people and experiences that shaped him to face an impossible situation with grit and determination. And so I think of Tommy's experience as one that relates to the Christian life because it's also exposed to difficulties. 
And these require patient endurance to, under, uh, to overcome impossible circumstances. So what does patient endurance look like for us? Um, and as we read in Revelation 14, verse 12, it says um, the word patience. And that word patience can also be translated into the word endurance. And in the Greek, the word for patience is hupomone. And that means to have um, capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances. It also reveals an individual's courage, endurance, and willingness to suffer. And that word, hupumone, it occurs about seven times in the book of Revelation. And it describes uh, the response of God's people when their faith is being threatened. It's also mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, when John, who um, wrote the book of Revelation, um, it describes his experience on the island of Patmos because he too endured suffering with Christ as he awaited God's kingdom. Um, so I'll read that verse, Revelation 1, verse 9. It says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is what John was experiencing. And it's also what God's people would experience in the last days, that they need the grit of the Holy Spirit to work in them to defy all odds. And in the immediate context of Revelation 14.12, um, that's really designated for the end time um, people of God in relation to what is happening to them from Revelation chapter 12 to 14. And um, we know that that talks about persecution, it talks about deception and, and suffering, and even that their lives are being threatened. But these people endure, and they know they can rely on God for deliverance. So this endurance doesn't come from themselves. It comes from God and their commitment to him and having this conviction that he will deliver them. It comes from that relationship with God. And for John who wrote these words, he wrote this whole book of Revelation. And the first um, words in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it says... It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's the primary purpose of this book. It is to teach us about Jesus. And John is its author, but the content of this book, it comes from Jesus. And if we keep reading that verse, it says, which God gave him, who is Jesus, to show his servants. So, the book of Revelation, it's not just John's idea, but he received what it says through visions that were given to him from Jesus. And so John wrote this book on the island of Patmos. And it's just, yeah, what, it's not really an exotic island in the Greek sea, uh, sorry, Greek island in the Aegean Sea, um, but it's a rocky and barren island and John was sent there because of persecution. It was because he was preaching the word of God and he had such an effective testimony for Christ that the Roman authorities decided to exile him to this desolate island. And this is where they banished criminals and political offenders to this island of Patmos. And here... They thought they got rid of John. They thought they'd never hear from him again. They thought they silenced his influence because now he's on this um, deserted island and no one can listen to him anymore and that he would just die there from hardship and distress. But that wasn't God's plan. 
And it was on this desolate island that God revealed himself to John. And Jesus spoke to him in a powerful way through visions to reveal the events that would happen in the closing scenes of Earth's history. And it would reveal to him that Christ would ultimately triumph over all who rise up against him and his saints. And at that time, um, when John was living, they were fa facing dark times of persecution. But the words in Revelation show that there were even worse times that were to follow. So God's people needed to be encouraged by standing firm in Christ in view of God's plan for the righteous and the wicked. So from John's example, we see how he patiently endured through his trial on the island of Patmos, and God still revealed himself to him. And how can we learn from John and what happened to him? How do we have patient endurance? So I looked um, at a few verses. And the first one is um, from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and it talks about being patient through trial. So if you'd like to read Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the cold according to his purpose. When Paul wrote this, he was, yeah, the intention was to be, for it to be understood in a really broad kind of sense. And he included what was written um, in the following verses in chapter, uh, verse 35, 38, and 39. So it talks about uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and also life and death and principalities and angels. So all these things were included in um, the context of verse 28. So we see that God doesn't necessarily prevent the plotting of wicked men, but he causes their devices to work for good for those who during the trial and conflict, they maintain their faith and loyalty. And this was the same for John on the island of Patmos. Although he was exiled by his enemies to silence his voice in preaching the gospel, God still did something good for him there. And he wrote out the visions that God gave him, and they were to go forth as light and declare the purpose of God for every nation on earth. So God did something even greater than what his enemies tried to stop him do. And even for um, Tommy, it was by being held hostage and even losing a finger that Tommy Caldwell became more determined to fulfill his dream to climb this unconquered dawn wall. So even those hard times, they work together for good because at the end of the day, God's purpose is sovereign, even through hardship. Secondly, to have patient endurance, we must persevere through the pain. And this is a verse that really stood out to me um, when I got COVID. <laughs> um, and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. It says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. And the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. The reality is, is that we live in a world of sin. And as Christians, we're not immune to pain and difficulty. But what God does is that he doesn't take it away, but he gives us strength to endure and persevere through the pain. 
And I've kind of learned as I've gone through this health journey um, and the struggle that I've been through to actually be thankful for what I went through because it's taught me so much about health and how to take care, better care of myself. And finally, to persevere and to have patient endurance, we have to just keep going. So to endure to the end. Um, and we can read um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Because our example at the end of the day is Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And we endure the race that is set before us because Jesus endured the cross. So Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and had sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So we have to look to Jesus. And when we feel discouraged, just look to him and what he went through. We have to learn to endure through the hardship. And God allows even these small trials to prepare us for a greater trial, and we know that the, there will be greater trials um, just before Jesus returns. So Jesus is our greatest example of endurance. In verse 1 of Hebrews 12, it says that we are called to endure, and verse 2 gives us an example of who we are to look to as we endure. As we consider Jesus and what he went through, it was because his father allowed for it, and he knew that he was in his father's will. And instead of trying to fight it and rebel, he was surrendered to his father. And through that surrender, he was able to endure and finish strong. So that's, I guess, our encouragement for this morning, is to know that we can have patient endurance as we look to Jesus. And this patient endurance that is talked about in Revelation 14, verse 12, it's a characteristic of God's last day people. And you could say it's a character characteristic, um, and it's not just a doctrinal or ideological characteristic of um, God's people. It is God's character working in them that is to be reflected in the end times and to reflect his love because love endures all things. So as we look to Jesus, we will be able to endure as he endured, regardless of our circumstances. All we have to do is just stay surrendered to him. And as this message of the gospel goes into the world, God's people are also called to reflect his character and glorify him. And then God can point to them and say, here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we can be in that group. We can be the ones who endure and finish strong as we stay surrendered to his will, no matter what this world may throw at us because we look to Jesus, and we look to him who endured the cross and won. And that's my prayer for us this morning. Amen.
isn't that a beautiful message? Thanks, Hannah. Can we please stand for our um, closing song, You Raise Me Up? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you raise us up when we are down, when we are hard pressed, uh, when we are struck down, but we are not destroyed because we look to you who endured the cross and we look to you, the faith that you had in your Father and his promises. And Lord, I just pray that we can trust you no matter what our circumstances are, that we can keep going and have patient endurance. Of, um, of the saints which you have called us to be. So Lord, just give us that endurance that we need in the little trials and in the big trials and that we can get through them by faith and in your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.